Nice to see you all here. I'm going to share with you a little bit about what it means to think like a game designer and hopefully give you some insights you can take back and work on your own projects. So my life as a social gamer has been all about dancing on the edge between web apps and mobile and games. She mentioned I've worked on projects as diverse as Rock Band, Ultima Online, eBay, and Netflix. And to me, all of that is social gaming. So you've probably heard this word gamification. What does that mean? Does it mean a loyalty program on steroids, like Pogo has? Does it mean using game techniques to turbocharge your products or services or apps? Does it mean taking a real world activity and turning it into a game or game-like experience? Is it currently going through a hype cycle? Absolutely. And I'm not sure if it's peaked yet, but I think that it's actually opening up a lot of opportunity for all of us to build more compelling products. So today we're going to cut through the hype. Let's put aside this word, gamification. I actually think it's a trendy word for a much more important and larger story. So what is the real story behind that trendy word? I think it's what Will Wright, one of the greatest game designers ever, calls the Cambrian Explosion. Now the Cambrian Explosion was the proliferation of life forms and a lot of different kinds of life forms 500 million years ago. The Cambrian Explosion is similar. What's going on now is that games are everywhere. Everyone's a gamer. It is no longer something that primarily happens on a console in the living room with guys. It's really everyone and everywhere. So those of us in product land are looking at this and thinking, well, how can I get some of that juice for my product? How can I apply game thinking? Is gamification the right way? What does that mean? What do game designers know that I could know and do better work? Well, I can't tell you the whole story today, but I can give you a little glimpse and set you down the right path. So the first thing is to really know who your players are and design around their social style and their personal needs. The Gamerian Explosion means lots of different kinds of games on different devices. And that means there's a lot of different ways to delight and add fun to people's lives. One thing to ask yourself is who's playing and what's their social style? Are they collaborative? Are they competitive? Is it men, women, old, young? That will lead you into thinking about the core actions of your game, which is one of the fundamental ways that game designers approach this problem. So your, game, your players might be competitive. They might enjoy actions like winning and beating and taunting, challenging. And there's a lot of games that serve that. And that's not for everybody, but if you've got that kind of an audience, you're going to want to design around those actions. On the other hand, they might be more a cooperative style of gamer. Um, most of the most popular Facebook games, Cityville, Farmville, et cetera, are built around a cooperative style of game where the core actions or verbs are sharing, helping, gifting, greeting, exchanging. You may have an expressive style of gamer who really wants a form of self-expression and wants to create or lay out or design or customize. Those are the actions that are going to really satisfy somebody who's looking for an outlet for self-expression. You might have an exploratory kind of gamer who's really interested in checking out every nook and cranny of your service, who really wants to collect everything there is to collect, know what there is to know. This kind of gamer is going to be motivated by viewing content, curating content, completing collections, those kinds of core activities. Now, game designers know how to build positive emotions into their core activity loop. The activities I just mentioned are usually presented in some kind of loop, which means you play the game, and then you come back to the game, and you engage with it over time. So what you want to do is embrace that and put some positive emotions into your core activity loop. An example is Farmville for crops. A lot of game designers that I know were poo-pooing Farmville when it came out. They said, that's not a real game. That's silly. That's superficial. But what they missed was that the core activity loop of Farmville is actually very pleasurable to a lot of the people playing it. Gives you a bit of that Calgon take me away moment. There's a pleasure and satisfaction 
in growing and planting and harvesting crops and seeing beautiful graphics and cute little critters. I played Farmville with my four-year-old and it was actually one of the best gaming experiences the two of us have had. Another type of positive emotion is Foursquare's recommendations. If you start playing Foursquare and you see that not only can you check in, but you can get recommendations from nearby places, that's useful, it's fun, but it's also giving you a little bit of serendipity and crowdsourced spark of fun. Now, fun is not necessary to think like a game designer. Sometimes the positive emotion, such as Amazon, might be more about information and trust. If you look at Amazon, purchase messaging as a core activity loop, you can see that what they're going for is information and building trust. They let you know that you've bought something, they let you know they got it, they let you know when it's shipped, they let you know if it's going to be late. This is one of those things that creates a core activity loop that's outside of games, but has a fundamental positive emotion with it. Another thing game designers know is how to design over time. If you remember one thing from this, I'd like you to take this home. There are three key stages of your player's life cycle. They don't experience a game over time, and they're not going to experience your product if it's at all of a service. They're not going to experience it statically. They experience it over time. So a useful way to think about this is to think about taking your player on some sort of journey. Where are they going? Where are they headed? How is your software getting them there? There's three key stages. The noob, or novice, which everybody is when they start. The regular, who's learned the ropes, and now they're just using the software. And the enthusiast, or what we call power users, who are maybe the two to five percent, maybe eight percent if you're lucky, of people that really love your product, invest a lot of time and energy into it. Each of these people is going to have a different experience and needs different design techniques to be satisfied. Novices need a good onboarding experience. And there's many ways to skin that cat. One way is what Foursquare does, which is to use points and badges as an onboarding experience. The badges function as implicit goals or quests. And that lets people know this is what you can do, this is the rules of the game, this is how you play. Regulars who've learned the ropes really need fresh content or activities or challenges to keep them going, to keep them immersed. If you start using Foursquare, you can see these recommendations and you can also add your own recommendations. You won't necessarily do that the first time when you're learning, but it gives you something more to do that enriches your experience. Enthusiasts or power users really need some kind of exclusivity and recognition. They want to have an impact. These people devote a lot of time. And if you can think about systems that let them add value back, give them a special role, let them chat behind the scenes with devs, all those techniques, well known to game designers, can really help you hold on to and leverage and delight this small but really important group of players. Another thing game designers know how to do or aspire to do is to build a system that's easy to learn and hard to master. Now that's easier said than done. Most games don't quite meet it, but if you think that way and you strive for that, it will set you down the right path. So an interesting example is Quora. If you look at Quora through this lens, you can say, so how do I learn? Is the system easy to learn? How do I get started? Well, there's many ways. You can just read stuff. You can read answers, you can add a comment, you can vote. There's very light touch ways, very low risk ways to get involved and get started. What skill is someone developing if they play your game or your product? On Quora, the skill that you're developing is how to ask and answer a good question. If you're asking a question, they actually have an onboarding that creates some friction. Not anybody can ask a question. You have to jump through some hoops, which means the quality bar is raised. It's also true that on Quora, anybody can edit your question once it's posted, which is a very socially awkward yet interesting feedback loop that tells you what it means to play the game well. So what does it take to master the game? If you're trying to make something that's easy to learn and hard to master, how do you measure mastery? I think Quora certainly could do more in this over the coming years, but mastering it basically means writing questions that get answers, that get good answers, and writing answers that get votes. If you happen to be the founder of a company that somebody said, could you please answer this, and you come in, bingo. You've just mastered the game, as you can see from there. Now, a lot of people are excited about game mechanics and look at game mechanics as a way to manipulate behavior. Game designers, at least the really good ones, that's not how they think about it, and that's not how you should think about it either. Game mechanics 
are to light the way toward mastery. If you use them in that way, you will create a really great experience. Nike Plus is an interesting example of that. The Nike Plus coach uses clear feedback and progressive goals to light the way toward mastery. They start wherever you are. If you're just walking to run, there's a, there's a path for you. If you're training for a marathon, you have a different path, but each of those paths is clear and is offered to you to show you what it means to master running at the level you're at. Nike Plus also uses crowdsourced stats to drive community awareness. It feels really good to be part of something larger than yourself. And it's a simple technique, but it communicates something core about the game and what it means to play well. As players progress, you want to increase the challenge and complexity. This is called flow and game design lingo, and this is the flow channel. Every game designer I know has internalized this. This is what designing for engagement is all about, finding that balance between anxiety and boredom. And you do this by creating greater challenges as somebody gets more skill. One way to do this is progressive quests, as you can see, for instance, in Cityville. They also introduce new mechanics that you don't see when you're a beginner, but once you've leveled up a bit, bingo, there's something new to tackle. Game designers also know about how powerful it is to offer additional UI and power tools right when people are ready for them. So think about what can I hold back from my newbies? How simple can I make the interface? What can I let people earn? That will make a better experience and something that's also simpler to learn. And the last and possibly most important is to embrace extrinsic, intrinsic motivators like power, autonomy, and belonging. How many of you have ever read the book Drive by Dan Pink? If you haven't, you might want to think about it. He's got a great talk online. The punchline is that intrinsic value trumps extrinsic rewards in many surprising ways. It's been shown through research. So when you're looking at the features that you want to develop, you can use extrinsic motivators and game mechanics to drive task completion. That's a great use of extrinsic motivators, like the LinkedIn progress bar. If you want to get at deeper engagement, you're not going to get there just with game mechanics and extrinsic motivators. You need to hook into something intrinsic that delivers real value to your players. Great example is ModClos B, the buyer system, which delivers real power to their players by creating a crowdsourced clothing line within the online boutique. So if you want to know more about this, I'm going to be doing some workshops this coming spring and summer to help people develop better tools. You can uh, check out the website, follow me on Twitter, and I hope you take these ideas and go do some great work. Thank you.